when you're a progressive in Texas, if you couldn't laugh about things, you weren't gonna last. Molly was the source of all information about how to understand and to kind of put into some kind of context the stupidity uh, of politics in Texas. When I first started writing about these bozos, and I'd say something in the Texas Observer like, you know, Representative so-and-so runs on all fours and has the IQ of an adolescent pissant. And uh, I'd wait for him to come by with a horse whip, and all that ever happened was I'd see him in the Capitol the next day, and they'd say, baby, you put my name in your paper. She had a sense of humor that would keep you from being angry at her very long because she would take that pen and stick in you and, and make you realize that you were taking yourself way too seriously. And many times you didn't know what the heck you were talking about, and Molly did. I think of my time at the Texas Observer the way some people think of their college years, as, as just this happy, golden, sunshine-filled, beer-drenched. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful time. Having more fun than the law allows. Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is filmmaker and teacher Janice Engel. Her new documentary is called Race Hell, The Life and Times of Molly Ivins that premiered at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival. Janice is here at the San Francisco International Film Festival where her film is being shown. Welcome, Janice. Thank you for having me, Kamala. I really appreciate being here. Well, we appreciate you coming down. Your film is showing today, this evening in San Francisco. Yes, it is. Before we go on about the film, for the uninitiated and even for people like me, who is Molly Ivins? Molly Ivins, she is a six foot tall red haired Texan, a First Amendment warrior who spoke truth to power and gave voice to those that didn't have one. But her hook was that she used humor. She was wildly, fantastically funny. And she used the humor to go after both sides of the aisle, meaning the left and the right. Um, it meant when it, she got to a level, a certain level, you know, skewering, stupidity, basically, uh, people craved, whether they were Republicans or Democrats, they craved ink in her columns. It meant that you were worth writing about. And she wrote for? She wrote for many, many paper, different papers over the, the length of her career. Um, she started out as an intern at the Houston Chronicle, she was uh, born, she wasn't born in... She was born in Monterey. Yes, she was, but at one and a half or so, they moved to Texas. So she was raised in Houston, in the Tony area of River Oaks, and went to a private school no, uh, called um, St. John's. But she was, uh, she, her first journalism job was at the Houston Chron, Houston Chronicle, as an intern. And then her first, after she went to Columbia J School, which is the whole reason she went to get a master's degree, because in those days women needed to have an edge. The only way, otherwise you would have been relegated to what she called the snake pit. That's where they relegated women back then. What is snake pit? Snake pit is where you, you wrote about food, fashion, fluff, and gardening and lifestyle for the rest of your natural <laughs> born life. And she wasn't gonna have that. Um, so you needed to have an extra edge. So she, you know, credential. So she got her master's degree at Col the Columbia School of Journalism. Um, but she was then went to the Minneapolis Star Tribune, which was basically as, assigning women to do beats. It was one of the first papers at that time that did that. From there, she jumped to the Texas Observer. Probably uh, at the time, it was the only uh, liberal paper in the South, much less in the United States. Texas had a liberal newspaper? Yes, it did. It was called the Texas Observer. It was founded and started by Ronnie Duggar. And he hired two women in their early 20s to run it. Kay Northcott and Molly Ivins, and they were, they were amazing. I mean, it was two, at that time, two women as editor and co-editor. And then she jumped from the Texas Observer to the New York Times, where she lasted for six years and had a uh, tumultuous relationship. They because? Hired, they hired her for her unique voice and they fired her for her unique voice. And she came back to her beloved Texas, and she was with the uh, Dallas Times Herald, which under the how newspapers and the corporatocracy that took over back in the 80s started in the 80s after Reagan and others deregulated everything and it became the gobble gobble. Um, that newspaper was, was basically gobbled up. When I first started writing about these bozos, and I'd say something in the Texas Observer like, you know, Representative so-and-so runs on all fours and has the IQ of an adolescent pissant. 
and uh, I'd wait for him to come by with a horse whip, and all that ever happened was I'd see him in the Capitol the next day, and they'd say, baby, you put my name in your paper. She was a columnist. At that point, she was a columnist. She came back from, from the New York Times, and she was offered a job to be a columnist, to write her opinion. So it was the Dallas Times-Herald, that folded, that became the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, that folded, and then she went syndicated. She went out on her own, and she was at the height of her popularity in over three to 400 newspapers across the country. So she was a very well-known uh, columnist then. She was, a, yes, she was hugely known across the country and she became a pundit before there were pundits. She was on television shows and, yeah. Okay, so how did you come up with the title, Raise Hell? Well, Molly Ivins wrote in several of her columns, she would always say, raise hell, beloved. You have to raise hell when you're fighting for freedom. She always did a lot and that's what she did. Molly Ivins raised hell. And she basically implored all of us to raise hell as well, to bang those pots and pans, get out there in the streets, let them know. You know, we're, she, she had a very famous column and she repeated it when she was in speeches and, and talk shows and whatever. You know, it, we are the deciders. We are the people who run this country. Those people up in your state capitals, up in Washington, D.C., they're just the people we've hired to drive the bus for a while. So she was very gung-ho about uh, individual rights. Not just individual rights, but every kind of right. First, she was a First Amendment warrior. How did she influence you? How did you discover her story? So how I discovered her story is from my producing partner, James Egan. We had been pals for a long time, and he wanted to make a film with me. And so um, back in spring of 2012, he called me up and he said, you must go see this one woman show. I live in Los Angeles at the Geffen Playhouse called uh, um, uh, Red Hot Patriot, Kick-Ass Wit of the, Red Hot Patriot, the Kick-Ass Wit of Molly Ivins. And I said, why? He said, you have to go see it. It's written by a, a, a twin sister playwrights. I'm friends with one of them. And I went to see it. And I'm just telling you, you must go see it. It stars Kathleen Turner. Mm. So I went to see it. It was the last week. I got one ticket. And I laughed through the entire thing. It was a laugh a minute. And much the same way as James, he's from Baltimore, I'm from New York. We both lived in Los Angeles. I went to university in Los Angeles and I stayed. I would go back and forth to New York. But I really didn't know who Molly Evans was. I had heard of her. He hadn't heard of her. He was, he was totally like ashamed because he was a, an activist. He had made activist documentaries, myself included. And I, I, you count me in too. I also had not heard of her. Right. And she had been compared to Mark Twain. Will Why do Rogers, you think that is? Why do you think Will Rogers and Ida Tarbell. Well, so I got home that night and I Googled everything I could on her till three in the morning. And I was, that was it. I was shocked. I mean, I was shocked that I didn't know about her. Um, she was a Texan. I think that the newspapers that she was in really, uh, I mean, she may have been in the newspaper that I grew up with in, in New York, but. I just didn't know of her. It just wasn't on my radar that way. In California? No. Uh, you know, I, because... I think if you were up in Berkeley, Berkeley, definitely, yes. Northern California, but I was in Los Angeles, and I just wasn't my focus at the time. Um, and I just didn't know of her. It was kind of amazing. Other than I knew of her probably from the early aughts because, or late 1990s, because she had dubbed George W. Bush Shrub the Little Bush, which I thought was hilarious. And I probably had seen her on Letterman one night, but it didn't... Register? No. Okay. How was Kathleen Turner? She was okay. She played, she embodied Molly to a certain degree uh, for the time period. Um, you know, it, it, in fact, she was lovely. She uh, gave us, uh, granted us an interview. Uh, after we, basically the, pro the project, when, when we found out we wanted to do this, James and I, basically I called him the next morning after I'd been Googling. And I said, what's going on? He said, nothing's ever been done on her. And I said, nothing's ever been done. Why do you think that is? Nothing was done Because it's the same reason we didn't know about her. Because she's a woman and, I don't, and she was a columnist. And I think she also probably, I know she rubbed up against the certain forces of power, you know, especially in the media world. You know, she basically spoke truth to power. And she used her, her quill as her dagger. <laughs> she was, you know, she says, you know, she practices, you know, her type of humor was satire. It's, you know, basically taking down the, you know, the, 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 the pomp. You know, she would stick her pen in them and, you know, bring them down to size. So, you know, that's what she did. And she was brilliant at it. And you think 
because she was a woman, there was no interest? Because it's curious that nobody made a film about her before you did. Lucky for us. Yes. So now that you discovered her, you've Googled her, you decided you wanted to make the film? Yeah, nothing had been done, so I said, let's go for it. So we met with the playwright, um, one of the sisters, Allison. She teaches at USC. James was teaching at USC, and I'm an alum of USC. And it turns out that the Engel sisters spell their last name the same way as I spell my name. So it became my joke saying, you know, Molly has her Engel in, in several other languages means angel. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started to joke around that Molly has her brigade of angels doing her bidding very Texan, doing her bidding for her. So we reached out to Allison. Allison put us in touch with Molly's chief of stuff, Betsy Moon. And Betsy Moon IMDB James and I and said, ah, hmm, these are for real. And so literally, I think within a week, we had approval from Molly's estate. Molly left her estate to the ACLU and the Texas Observer. Oh. Yes. And so we got a green light. And, but James and I knew that we needed a Texan on board. It couldn't just be the two, you know, carpetbaggers from the East. So we reached out to a, a mutually close friend of ours, one of my best friends, Carlisle Vandervoort, who is not only a Texan, she grew up in the same neighborhood as Molly Ivins. River Oaks. River Oaks. She was a, a, also a child of oil and gas privilege. Mm. She went to St. John's. And they, I mean, came up the same way. And Carlisle, Carlisle was an activist of LBGTQ rights and all sorts of things. And so James and I called her. And we didn't know that any of this until after we, we, we just called her because she was our Texan, our mutual Texan friend. And we said, do you know who Molly Ivins is? She says, hell yeah, I know who Molly <laughs> Ivins is. I grew up with Molly Ivins, reading her in the paper. And she, um, we basically, she likes to say, hard pressed her. James gave her 48 hours. She called back in less than 12 and said, I'm in. The other main reason, too, and Carlisle brings this up, and she knew why. I mean, one of the main reasons is, you know, we need to raise money. Making documentaries are very hard. That's the biggest challenge. Where do you find the money? And we knew Molly was a Texan. She was beloved by many. We found, I mean, I found that out as I, you know, dug in, did my archaeological dig for six years. But, six years? Yeah, I've been, made this film the past six plus years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we knew we were going to have to get money. In Texas, there was money. Every time we tried to get money, there was always a Wendy Davis campaign or there was somebody else's campaign. It was tough. But we knew that we needed a Texan because there's a certain way you have to ask for money. And Carlisle, having grown up in those circles, she knew how to go about, you know, asking for people with money how to give us money. And so we got our green light. Literally, I was on a plane four weeks later to go to Houston, and Carlisle and I drove to, drove to Austin. We got it, did our first six interviews. And at the last one, we did Jim Hightower. He allowed us to hold a fundraiser in his, what I call the Church of Hightower, which is his office, which is in a former church. And we did our first fundraiser, and we raised $17,000. Know. So that was a we were boost. off. We were off and running. I mean, initially to get started, Carlisle, James, and I ponied up, um, we, three, between the three of us, 10 grand. So whatever that is, th three, 3,500 approximately each mm. on our credit cards. So by the end of it, how did you end up financing the film? Well, what I can talk about, because we're close to making a distribution deal, so I can't really talk about the budget. But what I can tell you is that initially everything was done. We are fiscally sponsored by the International Documentary Association, the IDA. Mm. And once you have a fiscal sponsorship, and I say this to all people who want to make films, documentaries in particular, fiscal sponsorship, what that does is it creates you know, uh, an umbrella for you. So any donation is a tax deduction. And people feel much more comfortable you know, giving. OK, so it's a pass through. Yes, okay, it's so a pass through. So IDA is the one that gave Fiscally you Fiscally sponsored, right in the beginning. Okay. And so we could take tax deductible donations. And so everything we did in production for five, well, for six years, even now we're still getting donations because we're, we're, slightly, we're over budget in our archival line item. Mm. So we need, we need to close that gap. And we've been telling people at our screenings, help us close the gap, which is about 65,000. Yeah, because when you, we have over 1,400 clips in this film that were licensed oh. and cleared. So there's a lot of fair use, but there are certain media companies that are very expensive. NBC, CBS, it's very expensive to get the, the clearances. So anyway, that's, that's the long and short, but most of it was done on donations, really pretty much all of it. And um, 
We had a very successful Kickstarter campaign in 2015. What we did is we tapped into Molly's constituency. We tapped into her beloveds. I, that, that, they were known as constituents, right? It, she, she had, they were known as her constituents, yes. And she was, every time she would go and speak somewhere, they, she would be asked, you know, uh, won't you run? Won't you run for the Senate, Molly? And, you know, won't you run for president, Molly? People really wanted her to run. She was a voice for those that didn't have a voice. Much like the, you know, freshman congresswomen are doing right now. Mm. She'd be loving that, and she'd be horrified about the other side of what's going on. But anyway, that Kickstarter campaign, really, that we blew past our goal in the first 10 days. Our goal was $75,000. We blew past it, and we ended up uh, raising over $120,000. But it kept going. And every time we would have an election or something, we would get this surge. I mean, we, and we also posted and we did stuff. And I mean, this is made by people who loved her. It's made by y'all. Thank you. We were in Sundance, which was like, I never could have imagined that I'd get into the Sundance Film Festival. I thought, why? I thought for sure South by Southwest because Molly's a Texan. But why not Sundance? I mean, you, you teach filmmaking, so why are you bringing your level down? That, thank you for reminding me of that because I'm, a, I'm an insecure filmmaker. Because I, you know, sometimes it's also you don't want to think you're. There's um, a, I think creatives have a superstition. If, mm. if you, you know, don't, don't, don't ask for too much or, or you're, you're gonna, going to cause an evil eye on your gonna, Yeah, it's like a, in the Jewish religion, you're going to go poof, poof, poof. <laughs> In India, it's the same thing. You right. know, you're going to the evil eye and you're, yes. going to, you're going to screw your karma. Yes. Don't do that. Um, I've, st I've, st I've stopped doing that because, you know, I believe in Matrika Shakti. <laughs> I know what that is, and the power of belief and the, and the word. And the fact is, is no, we absolutely deserve to be in the Sundance Film Festival, and we did it all on our own. We're the little engine that could, a tiny, tiny team. And we submitted a rough fine cut. We had an extension for a late submission, and we did, and we also submitted to South By. Mo Molly Ivins has rescued us every step of the way. And in fact, about 2014 or 2015, 2015 around our Kickstarter, I really kept getting, I meditate and stuff, and I kept getting these very deep inner messages, get out of the way, get out of the way, and get out of the way. And so I really started to do a practice of getting out of the way and allowing whatever was supposed to come through. And Molly actually came to me around that time because in a big dream. I had a big dream about her. And I was like, wow, she just blessed this project. I am out of the way. So Molly is driving this bus. And we're just damn, damn lucky bunch to be blessed to be on her ride. What do you want people to go away after seeing the film or if they haven't seen the film? Well, I think, you know, first of all, I want people to know who Molly Ivins is. Not who she was, but who she is. Because Molly Ivins is almost more relevant now than when she was alive. She died in 2007 of uh, cancer, breast cancer, three times, very virulent form of cancer. Mm. And, um, but she, was incredibly prescient. So much of what she wrote and what she said, we're talking 15, 20, 30 years ago, is happening right now. And I mean super prescient. Um, you know, she said, uh, it's not a left to right issue. It never has been. It's always top to bottom. And she's right. You know, it comes from the bottom up. It has nothing to do with left and right. That's just a way to distract. So she was, Molly was an incredible student of history. She was a voracious reader. As, as Jim Hightower said, you know, she was smarter than a tree full of owls. <laughs> Very Texan. And she was. She, she read five to six newspapers a day. You know, she had a stack of books, you know, that she read a week. She just was like this walking encyclopedia of information. Now, don't you know that that's what we do in this country over and over? We get so scared. So, so scared, some real menace, we don't make them up. So scared of communism, or crime, or drugs, or illegal aliens, or terrorism, that we think we can make ourselves safer by making ourselves less free. Now, it's a logical proposition that won't hold a drop of water. But it's amazing how consistent that response is in American history. And we are in another such time so frightened that we think we can make ourselves safer by damaging our own freedoms. 
Now, when you make yourself less free, you're not safer. You're just less free. And she knew that history repeats itself. It's cyclical. You know, the old adage, you know, if you don't know history, you're destined to repeat it. But she was a student of it and a scholar of it. And so she know, knew that the cycles happen. Well, we're living in a time where those windows of cycles are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So inevitably, the problems repeat themselves. Is that prescience? Yes. But it's also knowledge. And she knew that. And so she really wanted people to, to know that and to know what you're up against. And her overriding message is, um, you know, she was a First Amendment warrior. Her, she donated a, a free gathering or speech for the ACLU every month of her life, even when she was dying of cancer. She made a promise to the late John Henry Falk, who broke the blacklist, was her mentor, when, on his deathbed that she would do that for him. And she did. And she would go to tiny towns and meet the four or five other, you know, central, centrist or, or progressives in the basement of a library and talk about the First Amendment. And she really, really carried that banner. And her overriding message is, you know, it is up to us. This is our deal. We are the deciders. We are the ones who run this country. And so it's up to us, we the people. You know, Jim Hightower says it. her overriding message is that it's up to us to do the heavy lifting. How did you find the courage? Did you get inspired by her courage? Oh, I'm definitely inspired by Molly Ivan's courage. I'm definitely inspired by Molly Ivan's courage. She was one of the most courageous women I think I've ever read about or gotten to know. And I, would del I mean, I did a deep dive in her archives for, you know, six years. Um, her brother, Andy Ivins, who I finally got an interview with, I was trying to track him down for about a year and a half. I got his interview three weeks before he passed away, also of cancer. The chemo killed him. He was only 64. Molly was only 62 when she died. And her father also died of cancer. Yes, he did, but he killed himself yeah. rather than have to face it. Um, Andy said that the thing his sister was most proud of, he wanted, he said this, he wanted people to know this at her memorial. The thing Molly Evans was most proud of was that she had gotten sober the last 18 months to two years of her life. To add to that, her dear friend Annie Lamott, the novelist and author, told me the same thing. She said, Molly Evans is the most courageous woman and person I have ever known. And I said, why is that, Annie? And she said, because she had been given a, get, a death sentence. She had just gotten sober, finally fully sober. She had gone to drunk school for a number of years. It was well known that she was a, a pretty hardcore alcoholic, but a highly functioning one. And um, she got sober the last 18 months to two years of her life. And most people would have said, screw it. I'm going out in a blaze of glory. I'm not going to bother. She got sober. This was a woman who could speak truth to power and was fearless towards those in power until she was faced with her own death, finally decided to face her own truth. That's courage. Yeah, for sure, courage is one thing that seeps through the film. Thank you. Janice, we have run out of time. Wish I had more time to talk to you. Hopefully we'll catch you some other time since you teach here in San Francisco. I do, I teach at the Academy of Art University. I teach uh, very, very curious and hungry students from all over the world in the motion picture television department. I teach documentary film. I teach a workshop with another teacher called Production Hub where we create public service announcements and branded content for the San Francisco Fire Department, the Independent Living Resource Center, and a variety of other institutions here in the Bay Area. So hopefully we'll catch up with you then. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me and raise hell y'all. <laughs> And thank you for watching. If you missed any of our shows, you can catch them on our website. Join us next week for another new conversation. Until then, goodbye. Louis Laban, that was so beautiful. I trust it will be read at my funeral, uh, which, by the way, is not uh, coming anytime soon. I, th I thought... I wanted to call this evening a tribute to Molly Ivins not dying yet again. Um, seemed like a good plan. She was one tough cookie. I mean, we all saw it. Various people can tell you about seeing her give huge talks where she couldn't even stand up.
I do think that uh, those of us who care about, you know, such ephemera as the Bill of Rights, um, <laughs> it's a good time to dig in. It's a good time to talk loud. 